We have a, an Ask the Pastor question that actually came several weeks ago. And I spent a little bit more time on this than usual because the question deals with a couple of passages that even by some of the greats in our faith are one of the several of the more difficult passages to understand in the New Testament. So if you have your Bible, open to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to kind of give you the, the verses, and then I'll read the question for you. So 1 Peter chapter 3, um, the verses in question are 19 and 20, but I'm going to back up to 18 so we, we kind of understand in context what's going on in this passage. So 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now the two verses in question are 19 and 20. Uh, it says, in which he, he being Christ, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through. Now then there's another verse, um, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, that I want to read as well, because that's part of the question. It says, uh, For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Okay, so I'm going to approach this a little bit backwards. Okay, I'm going to start at the end with verse 6, and then I'm going to go back to the other verses. Um, the question is this. How do you understand 1 Peter 3, 19 through 20, and 4, 6? Is there going to be preaching of the gospel to those who have died? My understanding is no. And I'll tell you why. First, we need to understand the, the, the phrase of this question is not really conveying what is being said in this passage. Okay? The dead in this passage are not those who were living and then died, although there's a slight possibility in the second verse this might be the case. Okay? In the second verse, uh, verse 6, the second passage, um, he says, um, For that is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Well, let's back up, all the way back up into chapter 3, because... In verse 18, I think we find our answer to chapter 4, verse 6. In uh, chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Okay? What I think is that this is, everything in between here is kind of a parenthetical statement from verse 18 to verse 6 of the next chapter. For why was the gospel preached? Uh, for this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead. I don't believe in verse six that Peter is saying that those that have already died are being preached to in the grave. As a matter of fact, uh, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes that the dead 
know nothing. Okay? They, they, they don't have an understanding of anything. They're in a state where they don't really, they're not being taught. Okay? Because at that point, all the options that they've been given have been met, and they're in one of two places. Okay? So when he says, uh, for this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, I think he's saying that those who are dead are, are dead in Christ. Those who have not yet been made alive by faith in the grace of the cross. Okay? So when he says, for this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, that's who the gospel is for. The gospel isn't for those who are alive. The gospel is what made them alive. Okay? So he's preaching to the dead in Christ, those that are still in their flesh, that they might be made alive in the Spirit as Christ was alive. So we're seeing a comparison between those who are saved, those alive in the Spirit, and those who are dead. They're already dead in their sins. Uh, John chapter 1 tells us that the world is already judged. That without faith, we don't need to judge them because God already has. Okay? So the only out from that death is the cross. So I don't believe verse 6 really ties back into 19 and 20, except that it's the same flow of thought, and yet he's inserting this, this kind of parenthetical statement right in the middle here. And this is where we come into um, a, a little bit of concern. Because verses 19 and 20 in 1 Peter are the foundation for purgatory in the Catholic faith. faith. And I don't believe that there is a purgatory. I believe that once you have died, Scripture says that it is given to man once to die and then the judgment. Okay, so I don't think after you die you get another chance. All Scripture is interpreted in light of all Scripture. Scripture does not contradict itself. So when you have something that is an apparent contradiction, you look at the flow of Scripture and figure out which passage you're misunderstanding. Okay, and in this case, this passage, make, there's a couple of things that stand out to me that kind of let me know that, that Jesus didn't go back and preach the gospel to those who were dead. And it's all based on words that are present and words that are not present. Okay? So in verse 19, it says, In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now first, when it says he went, the idea of went is not that he physically got up and moved to a new location. It's that he did what he did. Okay? There's oftentimes it says that God went and spoke. It doesn't mean God removed himself from wherever he was to go somewhere else. He's already there. God exists everywhere at the same time. Where can we go to flee the Spirit of God? If I ascend to the mountaintops, he is there. Even if I go down to the depths of Sheol, there he is. Okay? We can't escape him. So God does not physically get up and go somewhere to speak. It simply means... He does what he does, or he did what he did. So the idea of went in the English really kind of adds a, a, a bizarre twist to this that can cause us to stumble. But went here is not saying that he physically removed himself to a new location. Okay? But then the next word is proclaimed. Now oftentimes, this word proclaimed is used to talk about proclaiming the gospel. And yet that's not what's being said here. Because it doesn't say what he proclaimed, does it? Compare this to our Great Commission. When we are given the Great Commission, we are told to go and preach the gospel. We are to proclaim and speak forth the good news. And yet here... It just says, he proclaimed. He said something. So the word that I'm interested in here is not the word that is present, but the word that is absent. Gospel is not here. So we have Jesus doing what he did, 
and he proclaimed something. And then it says, to the spirits in prison. Now, the key word here that I want to look at is spirits. Because we see that only four times throughout Scripture is the word spirit used. One, it is used in reference to the Holy Spirit of God. Has the Holy Spirit of God ever been in prison? Will He ever be in prison? So obviously it's not the Holy Spirit of God. It speaks of the angelic host as being spirits. The angelic host, are they in prison? Will they ever be in prison? Well, we don't think so. Not unless they would stumble. But at this point, they're not in prison. So that eliminates them. Well, then it talks about man. And it talks about man having a spirit. Is man in prison? Well, you know, one of the lines of thinking is that um, he's going back and he says, uh, in God's patience, uh, God, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Some people interpret this to go, oh, these were the people that were alive back before the flood, and they've been in prison because of their sin. Well, the problem is, I can find nowhere in Scripture that it talks about man as spirit. It talks about man as having a spirit. It says the spirit of man or man's spirit. It doesn't talk about him as just being a spirit <coughs> being. So the word that, that is missing here for me that is significant is man. So we have spirits. There's only one other category left of spirits that we see throughout Scripture. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the angelic host. It doesn't say that it's man's spirit. So what does that leave us? The demonic hosts. The spiritual beings. Now, this is where things get a little bit shaky that I'm not as convinced, but I believe I'm on to something. Because we go down a little bit further, so if it can't be the Holy Spirit, it can't be the angelic host, it is not the spirit of man, if it's the demonic host, then we have to interpret this next passage in light of that. Because they, who's they, the demonic spirits, formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Okay, so if it's not people, it's the demonic spirits. Now we know in Genesis, at, at about this time, it says that the sons of God came down and they mated with the, the daughters of men and they gave forth the race of the Anakim and the Rephidim, the giants. Okay, now my thinking, and I, I am very willing to be wrong on this, but my thinking is, this is the only time that we see the demonic host active, prior to the flood. And for whatever reason, what they did caused God to take that set of the demonic host and put them in prison. Okay? So, we know that there are demons that are out there that are working. Jesus confronted them throughout His ministry. The apostles confronted them throughout their ministry. You've probably run into them in your life. You may not have known it, but you probably bumped them that's true. You should. So I'm going to work backwards through this passage again. If this is the demonic host that God has put in prison, what is it that Jesus proclaimed to them? It's not the gospel because they can't be saved. So what did he proclaim? I think he proclaimed his victory. I think Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he let out a shout that all the spirits... Those in prison, those free, those in the angelic coast, even in the spirit of man, something changed. And Christ proclaimed his victory. Death, hell, and the grave, he took the keys. He conquered death. Sin no longer holds dominion. Grace does. Because grace always supersedes sin. So my understanding of this passage to bring this all into a nutshell, 
and, and honestly, guys, I spent two weeks looking into this. I'm, I'm stripping this down to its bare nugget. Okay? And, and if you want to do research on it, prepare to go egghead. Because there are a lot of very wise men that have torn this passage apart and they're parsing the Greek and this one parses it this way and comes up with this answer and this one parses it this way and comes up with this answer. Okay? But what my understanding of this passage is is that when Christ who was alive in the Spirit was dead, I don't believe He went to hell. That's another topic for another day. I don't believe He went to the hell part of Hades, the, the hot part of Hades. I believe that he was in paradise because that's what he told the thief. Today you will be with me in paradise. Okay? And then he proclaimed to those spirits that were in prison, hey look, I won. You lost. All those plans that you had that you thought were going to come to victory, they failed. I win. That's as simple as I can make it. Going down to verse 6, I don't think verse 6 is a reference back to 19 and 20. I believe 6 talks about those who are dead in Christ, those who have no life. They have not yet been made alive in the Spirit. They have not been born of the Spirit. They are dead until such a point as they become alive. So, David... Four pages of notes for you. <laughs> All right, if you have your Bibles, open up to John chapter 10. by saying Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. I have no problem with people saying Happy Holidays. They think they're sorting us by going, oh, we're avoiding Christ. Do you know anything more holy than Christ? Do you know any celebration other than Easter or Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday that is more worthy of celebrating than His birth? I don't. So I'm okay with them saying Happy Holidays. I think it's a holy day. I think it should be. Okay? So I have no problem with this. Um, in John chapter 10, verse 22, there's this one verse, I want to kind of focus on this. Uh, every Christmas I do a history lesson. Today's our history lesson. So we're going to start in verse 22, and it says, At that time the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So, verse 22, does anybody know what the Feast of Dedication is? Hanukkah. Dennis. Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights, the Feast of Dedication. It's called the Feast of Dedication because, I'll get to that in a minute, because we have a lot of history that we have to cover before we get to the Feast of Dedication. So, we're going to go back <clears throat> way back. Genesis. Nope, we went that far back last time. <laughs> Actually, we're going to go back to about uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, that era. We know that Israel had fallen, been taken into captivity by Assyria. We know that Judah had fallen, was taken into captivity by Babylon. But we know that they came back. God took them out of the promised land. As a matter of fact, He took them out for a very specific number of years. It was a number of years equivalent to the number of Sabbath years that they forsook. So we know that it was 70. It actually was about 72, and it depends when you look and when they came back. But God required of them a Sabbath rest for the land. So they worked the land for six years, and then on the seventh they were required to give it rest. And God would provide enough for them in the sixth year 
that they would survive not only the sixth year, not only the seventh year, but the eighth year under harvest. Okay? Now, one of the ways that the Jews worked around this was they wouldn't work the land themselves, they'd rent it out. And they'd let other people work the land for them. Because we know that God said that when I required of you the Sabbath rest and you denied the land its rest, I am requiring it of you. And so he kicked them out for the required number of years. Now, when Israel, when the, the Jews were in exile, we have a very significant event happening. The entire book of Daniel contains a significant event. We know that when Daniel came into the king's court under Nebuchadnezzar, he and, and a number of other young men, probably teenagers, were, were brought out from among those in exile and they were cleaned up and they were, they were taught how to dress, they were taught how to talk, they were uh, given certain foods to eat which they actually denied and said, no, let us eat ours and see if we don't do better than if we eat the stuff that you give us. And, and so they gave them a, a set number of days and they ate only their food and they found out that they were actually more advanced, they were healthier, they were further along in their studies than those that ate the food from the king's table. Okay, and, and we know that we have uh, Daniel and then the three that, that are known in Scripture, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We, we know that those excelled positions of great authority. We know Daniel was at one point second in the land. Okay? Now, why is this significant? I believe it's significant because God took the Jews out of the land in which he placed them to be a blessing to all nations and he took them and he put them in another land he scattered them <coughs> the diaspora the word the Hebrew Bible all of a sudden instead of being focused just in that little tiny piece of land that is Israel was spread all over in Asia and the Middle East up into Eastern Europe down even into Africa, all of a sudden the word has gone out. We see the same thing happening in the book of Acts. Because Jesus said, go, and the apostles stayed, and so God turned up the heat and he dispersed them out of Jerusalem. Because Jesus said, you're going to go from, from uh, Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And where were they? They stayed in Jerusalem. And so God said, no, I said go, and he made it so they went. And we see the same idea in the church as God did with his people in Israel. He dispersed them so that the word would go out. Now, we talked about a number of prophecies last week. Go back, look at your notes from last week, because these prophecies, we're seeing portions of them being fulfilled in this period that we call the intertestamental period. It's also known as the years of silence. Okay? Okay. It's silent because God did not author any divinely inspired writings. But it's not silent because God was not speaking. God was moving. God was acting. God was doing incredible things to bring about the fulfillment of his prophecies. So, <clears throat> why is it significant? Uh, Daniel and, and, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, why? Because they brought the prophecies... They brought the Hebrew Bible, and when they were sent home, the writing stayed in the east. Now keep in mind that Babylon, the Chaldean Empire, stretched from parts of India, and it came all the way over into Greece. Okay? Came all the way down into Egypt. So we know that the, the, the word was spread throughout that. And, and we see, as we get into the Christmas story, where did the wise men come from? The east. How would they know to come? How would they know to follow the star? I think they, that uh, Daniel left stuff for them. He left pointers. The prophecies were there. The things were there. And they had the teaching of God from the exile so that they would know God was setting things in place. So now let's get into 
a little bit of this uh, after the exile. They come home. Matter of fact, I'm going to back up because this is one of those things that, you know, people all the time say, oh, well, you know, the, the, the prophecies, you can kind of mold and bend them to say what you want. But Isaiah prophesied that a, a leader was going to be raised up in Babylon. And this leader's name was going to be Cyrus. And Cyrus was going to be the king that would set Israel free to go back to the promised land. Now, this was done well over 100 years before the exile even happened. So we have 170 plus years that this man named Cyrus was prophesied about. And guess what? Cyrus rose up to power. The wise men from Israel that were in Babylon at the time, and, and actually at this point it's the Medo-Persian Empire, they come to him and say, hey, you're in our book. Look at this. That's you right here. And guess what it says you're going to do? You're going to let us go. And what did he do? He not only let them go, but he took up their cause and defended them. So, Israel goes back to the promised land. This is significant because Scripture says that the, the Christ child, the Messiah, Mashiach, was going to be born in Bethlehem. We talked about that last week. If they're scattered all over the world, how can he be born in Bethlehem? God had to bring them back. Okay? That the, prof the prophecies and the promises would be fulfilled. They had to come back. God was not surprised by any of this. When God sent them out into exile, he didn't just wake up on the wrong side of the bed one morning and go out in a hissy fit and said, you know what, I'm tired of y'all. <laughs> that would be me, not God. Okay? That would be you, not God. God had everything carefully planned. He knew it was going to happen. He's the master chess player. He knows what's going on. He's already moves and moves and moves ahead of you. All right? So, Jews are free to return approximately uh, 538 B.C. Um, Josephus writes in his uh, Antiquity of the Jews that the Jews actually showed Cyrus his name in the scriptures and that was part of the, the cause that um, he sent them back. But now at the same time as, as the Medo-Persians are, are being a power in the east, we see this new power growing in the west. And it starts off with a man named Philip of Macedon. Um, he was a king in Macedonia. And his, his goal, his drive, was to unite all the Macedonians in the Greek city-states under one king. Okay? He was assassinated. He failed in his mission. But he, he left a descendant who was going to do that and more in his son Alexander, who we know as Alexander the Great. Now, <clears throat> Alexander spreads out from Greece. He comes around through um, Byzantine, uh, well at that point, yeah, it would be Byzantine. He comes down uh, through Turkey, he comes in, he, he, he takes over Israel simply by showing up. They had just become a new nation, they hadn't been established by the, as themselves for long. They see his massive army coming in, they walk out and they say, hey, we want to be friends. Okay, now one of the things that Alexander did that was genius, but not because of his own, I believe it's genius because God did it, was he did? He had a program called Hellenization where he introduced all of the countries that he went to to the idea, the understanding of Greek thinking, Western thinking. This is, this is the, how we think. We think in a Western Greek type of manner. We don't think Eastern. And as he comes through this process of Hellenization, he lead, the people that he conquers, whether by force or by just immediate surrender, he grants a great deal of freedom to. The Jews can still worship their God. They just have to acknowledge that Alexander is their leader. They, the Jews are allowed to, to live their lives pretty much unencumbered as long as they recognize that the Greeks are their bosses. Okay? So Alexander goes off. He ends up dying of a venereal disease in Babylon. Uh, his kingdom is fractured into four parts, each part going to one of his four leading generals. The only two that really 
concern us are Ptolemy and uh, Seleucia. And these two empires, the Ptolemy started off down in, in Egypt and theirs was up into Israel and, and the surrounding area. The uh, Sel um, It's not the Seleucids, I'm sorry, that was not the right name. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. They started out over in uh, Babylon and came up to the, the Ptolemaic Empire. Over a period of time, they fought back and forth. They fought back and forth. The Seleucids actually took over Israel. This is where things started to go south for the Jews. Because the Seleucids were not content with them to just acknowledge the Greeks as their leaders. They wanted them to become Greek. And so we see a period of time where the Jews are suffering under this, this Hellenization. We see a, a leader arise. His name is Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Uh, he called himself Epiphanes because he called himself a god. And he wanted to be worshipped as a god. And so he came in. He established a number of laws to break the Jews of their Jewishness. Um, <clears throat> He forbade circumcision. If any woman was found with a child, a male child that had been circumcised, they put the child over her neck and killed her. Um, they required sacrifice to their gods. And this gave rise to what became known as the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, a priest by the name of Jude, uh, Matthias, um, they came to his village and they said, you must sacrifice to our God. He said no. So another priest stepped forward to sacrifice and Matthias killed him and then killed the envoys from the Greeks that were telling them to sacrifice. This began the Maccabean Revolt. Now what the Maccabean Revolt is huge because you have a relatively untrained, unarmed militia. These are guys that are, are more at home tending sheep and raising crops and fishing than they are with a sword and shield. And yet you have them going up against one of the most firmly established armies of the day in the Seleucid Empire. And yet time and time again, the Jews won. Okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the things that grew up out of this Hellenization process are the two political religious parties called the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Okay, that grew up out of this time. The Sadducees, they held to the belief that only the written word was to be adhered to. That all the oral traditions, they were not necessary. They were just other people's thinking about the written word. And as such, because they didn't hold to the written word, they, they fell under a lot of the Hellenization. They, they found a lot of agreement with the Greeks. And as such, they became favored by the Greeks, and they were the party that, that rose to power. They're the ones that came into wealth. They're the ones that had the least trouble. Well, there was a group that resisted them that said, no, it, it's not just the writings that we hold. It's the, the, the oral traditions as well. And they became known as the separatists, which... The word is Pharisee, okay? So Pharisee means a separatist. They're the ones that said, no, we're not going to go with you guys. We're separating ourselves out, which is really funny because some years later, we actually have a third party that grows up that are like the separatists of the separatists, and that's the Essenes. They're just separating from everybody. So, <clears throat> so we have this conflict, and it comes to a head... Um, that there are two leaders in, in Israel. They're the two sons of the last woman through whom the high priesthood would come. We have on one side uh, John Hyrcanus, and on the other side we have his brother Aristobulus. John Hyrcanus was backed by the Pharisees. <clears throat> Aristobulus was backed by the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees had the wealth, but they didn't have the numbers. And so when... Basically, the fighting broke out between these two brothers and their religious ideology. Aristobulus took the Sadducees and he 
went and he tucked himself away in the Temple Mount. Now the Temple Mount was a fortress within the fortress of Jerusalem. And he sent out a call for help. Okay. Now at this point, the Maccabees had overthrown the Greeks, but the Hellenization was still in Jerusalem. The Sadducees were still Hellenized. And, and they're sending out a word for help. And the word goes to a Roman general by the name of... of uh, oh, and I just lost his name. Give me a second. I'll find it in my notes. Because his name's important. Um, Pompey. Word goes out from Aristobulus. And he calls for help. They are surrounded at the Temple Mount. The, the Pharisees don't quite have the muscle to break through. But the Sadducees can't get out. So right now, there's no one that can really be a ruler because the high priest is supposed to be in the temple and, and that's where Aristobulus is. But John Hyrcanus controls all of Jerusalem and all of Judea. So Pompey comes with his legion and he comes marching into Jerusalem. And he meets, he's coming in, he's coming to deliver Aristobulus. Hey man, this guy called for help, here I am. Well, I think he's looking more politically motivated than that. He's looking at a country that's in the midst of a civil war, neither side of which is capable of taking him on. So he's thinking, hey man, here's free country for grabs. And this controls the crossroads from Egypt out to the east and up into Europe. Okay? So this is a hugely strategic point for any nation to control. So he's like, hey man, i got to take advantage of this opportunity. So he comes into Jerusalem. He gets to Jerusalem. I think he's, he looked and he realized, wow, man, all the people of Israel are, are pretty much opposed to this guy that's in the temple. So he does what any good thinking general would do. He sides with the side that's going to win. <laughs> and he switches sides. He, he jumps over to Hyrcanus' side and they breach the temple. Now, when they breach the temple... We have um, the second offense in the temple. Now, under um, Antiochus, he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. Well, when um, Pompey came in to the temple, he broke the walls down, they came in. His men also sacrificed uh, unclean flesh in the temple. That's the second great uh, issue. But, but see, all of that is, is set up. I need to back up to Antiochus because there's something really significant that happened when the Jews overthrew him because they had to come into the temple. He had been sacrificing pigs on their altar. So everything inside the temple is now unclean. So when they finally overthrow the military power and, and Antiochus IV was dead, his descendants looked and they're like, man, these people are nothing but a headache. It's just a small piece of land. We're better off over here anyway. They like us. They don't rebel every time we turn around. You know what? You can have the land. We don't want it. But now the Jews come in and they, they come into the temple and it's been desecrated. And it needs to be made clean. Well, in their search through the temple, they find one vessel of oil. And this is the oil that is to go to the lamp and the menorah and the holy place to, that is supposed to never go out. It's sufficient oil for one day. Now, um, Brian, would you go grab me the candle holder in the window there? And the one over there on the uh, credenza? <coughs> I want to use these as a demonstration so you guys can understand what's going on here. Does anybody know what this is? What is it? Menorah. What is this? No. No, this is a Hanukkah. Okay? Now, if you look, we have seven. But if you look, we have nine. Okay, now we have uh, the servant candle, which is the one that sits in the middle. Now, the menorah is the lamp that is supposed to be in the holy place. It was much bigger than this one. We believe it was much bigger than this one. And it was never to go out, okay? And, and there were the seven days of creation, and the, the, the servant candle, the, the servant light, would, the, all of these would be lit. And when they came in, there was only enough oil for one day. Well, it would take them approximately seven days 
to go through the process to get an oil that was pure, that was the, the, the virgin olive oil, the extra virgin, the, the first, that was only that was, could be used, and then it had to go through the process of being made holy. Well, they only had enough oil for one day. And yet, somehow or another, God stretched that to eight days. God, through just his miraculous power, and on the eighth day, they were able to get the process and, and everything was done, that they were able to have new oil to put into the lamp and the menorah was lit. It stayed lit that entire time. This is why the feast that Jesus is at is called the Feast of Dedication. They were dedicating the temple after it had been corrupt, after it had been defiled. They were dedicating it back to God. It's also called the Festival of Lights or the Feast of Lights because the candles were lit. It stayed, the, the candelabra stayed lit for the seven days. So if you look and you see, you know, you look and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's not a that's not a menorah. That's a Hanukkah, and this is for celebration of Hanukkah. Okay. So when we look in John chapter ten, verse twenty-two, it says Jesus was in Jerusalem. He was there celebrating the festival of lights, the the, the feast of dedication. He was celebrating with the Jews that they had overthrown their Greek oppressors and that God had done a miraculous thing in stretching one day's oil into eight days. And that, to me, that is just so cool because it reveals the humanity of Jesus. I mean, He's God. He knew all this stuff happened. He was watching it when it happened. But here He is. That's like us celebrating the 4th of July. If Christ were to be born in America in present day, and it talks about, you know, hey, Jesus went over to the church and they were doing their 4th of July celebration. And there he was, celebrating. That's, that's what that verse reveals to us. That Jesus was celebrating the, the festival of lights, the, the, the freedom, the independence of his country. Now, where, why am I saying all of this? Well, the Romans come in, they establish John Hyrcanus. A period of time goes by. The Hasmonean dynasty dies out. A new man comes up, declares himself to be the leader of the Jews. His name is Herod. Herod has the backing of Rome, but not the people of Israel. Rome makes another appearance. All of a sudden, we have a new king. Yay, his name is Herod. Herod the Great. Okay? Now, why is this significant? Why is it significant that Rome was in power at this time and all of this stuff took place? Why do we even care? We care because it fulfilled prophecy. Because God said that he was going to bless Abraham's seed and that through him and his house, all the world would be blessed. Okay? Now, God established a number of things by having Rome come in. Okay? And, and there's four things in particular that I want to share with you. The first thing is um, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Rome held sway with an iron fist. Now, in some ways they were very liberal, but in other ways they were very hard. Man, if you pulled a crime under Rome, the penalties were severe. Okay? They had the vias, the roadways. They stretched from Spain all the way through southern Europe, down around through Israel, down through northern Egypt, all the way back over almost to the Atlantic Ocean. They stretched from the Middle East, out as far, even in some places as far as India. Okay? So a person could travel from one end of the empire to the other end of the empire on safeguarded patrol roads. Now that's important because up to this point, when you cross from one country to another, you were taking a gamble as to whether or not they were going to accept you. Okay? But now this is all controlled by Rome, and so you were safe because the peace of Rome, there were guards that would protect you, and there was a way to get from point A to point B. So that's the first two points. The third point, a common language. Now what's interesting is the official language of Rome was Latin. But the common language was Greek. And it was the, the universal language. And again, you could go from Spain all the way out to India, all the way down into Africa, and you could speak one language and have a good chance of being understood anywhere in those places. Okay, somebody there was going to be able to understand you and get you what you needed. All right. Number four, this is something that is kind of weird because 
Rome was a polytheistic society. They believed in many gods, but Rome also embraced a lot of the cultures that were around them. That was one of the things that made them so great, is they would come in, they would beat this country militarily, and then they'd sit and they'd look at their society and they'd take the things that worked and discard the things that didn't. And so Rome, they were not opposed to a monotheistic ideology or, or theology. That was okay so long as it didn't conflict with your understanding that we are the boss. Now this turned later and it, it became a, a point of issue with the new church and with the Jews because they required you to sacrifice to their gods, one of whom they believed was the emperor. But early on in the development, they were A-OK -okay with having a monotheistic religion. So long as you, know, you don't push it on us, we're OK with that. All of these are significant because when the church is birthed, in the upper room when the Holy Spirit falls and Jesus has ascended, he's given them their commission and they go out. They can now go out to points from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to India. They can go from points uh, in northern Africa all the way up into northern Europe. And they can do it with safety because the roads are protected. They can get there because there are roads. They can go and they can speak a common language and be understood in any one of those areas that they went. So the gospel was unimpeded. And this idea of, of monotheism, that there is one God, while it might be looked at a little askance, it was not something that would cause an outright overthrow. Not until later years in the Roman Empire did that become a problem. So this is all significant because God was putting everything, every piece carefully into play. Now, we play chess quite a bit at our house. There are certain people that I don't like to play against because they're always two or three steps ahead of me. And I hate moving a piece and I'm thinking, aha! And then I realize, oh no! Because I just walked right into their trap and now I'm on the defense the rest of the game and it's only a matter of turns before I lose. God was moving the pieces into place so that when his son was born, the hope that he had promised Abraham thousands of years before would be able to be spread thousands of years hence. And he was very busily at work establishing it such that with the birth of Christ, okay, we have God made man, the hypostatic union, fully God, fully man. And yet with his death and resurrection, something that people could see and touch and feel, okay, the idea in Rome that there were, you know, God-men, they were the demigods, that was not a big deal. But, but in Rome, the idea of somebody dying and resurrecting, and you could actually, huh, touch them, put your hand in their wounds, that he could be witnessed by hundreds of people. There were a lot of myths about men that did such things, but there were no witnesses. Oh, yeah, that happened under the, you know, under Troy and, and Homer and, and Agamemnon and all of that. No, th these were people that were living. I saw it. I put my finger in his side. He was dead and now he's alive. So all of this was very carefully crafted and put into place because God was setting up the stage for that baby to be born. So I say to you again today, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Father, we bless you and we thank you. Because Father, you are so busy at work bringing to fruition your plans. You will not be frustrated. You will not be denied. We thank you, God, that you have established a plan and a purpose. And that you have knitted us into that plan and purpose. And I ask, Lord God, as we celebrate the birth of your son this month, Father, that our hearts and our minds, our focus would be set right on you. That our heart's desire would be to press in to know you more. Father, that we would not be distracted by the things that the world offers us. Those things that would titillate and tantalize. But Father, our hearts and our minds would be steadfast, pressing in after you. I pray, Father, that this Christmas season would be blessed Father, not so much in what we give or what we get, but Father, that we would draw near to you. 
that we would know you better this season than we have previously. And it would spur us on to greater uh, devotion, greater affection. <coughs> and we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.